teach is on uh, social engineering, and I know a lot of the topics that you've read on social engineering, they say it's like the art and science of getting people to comply to your wishes. Uh, and out, they, use, uh, they say that we use psychological tricks, but I mean, it's just, there's no psychological about it. I mean, we just, we use your weaknesses. Like, we can get passwords, phone numbers, credit card numbers, uh, social security numbers, pretty much whatever we have to, depending on uh, where we sit and where you sit. And, you know, uh, security is all about trust and trust and protection, generally agreed upon this as the weakest link in the security chain. The natural human willingness to accept someone at his or her own word, which leaves many of us vulnerable to attacks. Many experienced security experts emphasize this fact. No matter how many articles are published about network holes, patches, and firewalls, we can only reduce the threat so much. And then it's up to us. Well, up to Maggie in accounting for her or her friend across the hall from dialing in from a remote site to keep the corporate network secured. They'll never know it hit them until the attack is over, and maybe then they don't even know what's going on. Targeting your attack and attacking your host. The common goal of social engineering is to gain information. The specific motive of a social engineer may be hard, a hard item to determine. He could be looking for information for personal gain of knowledge or in the most extreme cases, corporate espionage. Most companies do not like to disclose the fact that they were a victim of, of a security compromise. This is something an attacker would, would uh, be gladly to exploit. The goals of social engineering can range from gaining unauthorized access to a system. <laughs> Hold up for a second, I went back to the top. Uh, <laughs> systems and information either to satisfy personal curiosity or even to commit fraud, network intrusion, industrial esp espionage, identity theft, or even just a dispute in network service. In all aspects of social engineering, the attacks are done against the weakest links of the organization, the people. Typically, targets for attacking include telephone companies, answering services, internet service providers, AOL, well, certain companies, financial and <laughs> military and government agencies, although the internet boom had had its share of attacks on small startup comp companies, generally focused focus is placed to large, larger corporate corporations. The bigger the company, the easier it is to masquerade as someone in another office of the corporation. Utilizing large corporations and attacking a busy department could yield a sm small treasures of information that could not only further informa information gathering, but may provide you with the exact information you are looking for. Asking questions at a busy department can provide answers, especially when they want to get off the phone and get back to an important project or just go out and smoke a cigarette. Attacking from a phone near you. Finding a prime victim may prove a bit difficult, but it really just depends on the attitude of the person you're talking to. Um, most people just are rude on the phone, you know. Um, and especially if you don't want to do like small favors or anything like that, you know, they're just real tough. Um, you can either just give up and just try finding someone that's a little bit more vulnerable to social engineering, or you can just push yourself a little bit harder, practice a bit more, and see if you can put the guy in a better mood. Does this work? Yeah. All right. Um, some other methods for this is just to call a place that you're trying to get information from a few times a week. Um, get to know the place you're, uh, you're attacking. Um, see who they are, when they work, you know, get to know their schedules. Make them think that you're actually a part of the company really well. Um, once, you, once, you, once they think that you're doing a really good job with the company, um, it, the attack will just be a little bit easier. Um, the one thing you really have to remember about when you're on the phone is, is you can pretend to be almost anybody you want to be or you can pretend to be from any company you want to be. Um, if you're going to call, call a place, you may not want to call them from a friend's phone or you know, even pay phones because you have the noise, the disturbance, a lot of people running around. That could be a dead giveaway. That's just not a good thing to have. Um, 
track phones. Like everybody goes to Walmart. Like you know the little, uh, yeah, the prepaid cellular companies and stuff like that. They're cheap. You can pick one up for like 50, 60 bucks. They're disposable. So I mean, if you can switch up numbers really quick, really often, and it may cost a little bit on personal uh, investment, but um, it's not that hard to get a hold of. Um, and especially being that it's disposable, if you need to dump the phone or anything like that, they melt really good. <laughs> um, if, if you're trying to call companies, don't use the general access 1-800 numbers that they give you out. Try to find direct lines in. Um, the general access 1-800 numbers, the big downfall is ANI. They'll be able to pick up your number rather quickly. Um, finding a direct line, you know, somebody walking down the street and they give you a business card or you just, you know, from that business card, that's a direct line in. And that's a little bit easier to get through on. Um, and when you're doing it, it takes a lot of practice. You, you know, you're working, you call up little small companies, Pizza Hut, just to find out who the last person was that delivered a pizza. Anything just to get you into the groove of it all. Once you're into the whole groove of everything, it's, it's harder for them to pick up on you. The more natural, the more confident you are, the easier things are. Um, I like, personally, I like to make my calls towards the end of the day. Everybody's getting a little bit tired. They're not thinking straight. All they do is want to go home. Everybody just wants to go home by like 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They're just watching that clock. Place a call. They're not going to pick up on little, sub, uh, little subtle things when they just want to go home. They're just going to be a little bit easier to go through. Um, IT staff are always told to make sure to look for these types of attacks. Um, you can avoid them a little bit easier. You know, customer service reps still get a little bit of information that you can help use to, uh, to get what you want. Um, HR, HR publishes stuff right out in the uh, in newspapers, internet websites, so they're going to be a little bit more easier on giving information, especially if they think you're a job broker. Um, um, when you start your attack, um, a great thing, um, like, uh, hello, my name is James, and I'm from AC Nielsen Market Research. Would it be possible for me to ask you a few questions for our statistics relating job markets in your local area? Um, something like that, you know, you're, you're giving a strong, confident front for them to see. You know, it's just like when you first speak to someone, it's just like your personal appearance when you walk up and shake someone's hand. The better you look or the better you sound, the more believable you're going to be. You can have a better report with whomever you're going to try speaking to. Um, once your target is willing to help, you know, you just lay out your story, uh, do your best. If you've done your research, you'll be well prepared for it, unlike us up here today. <laughs> from, from where we left off, if you're explaining you're researching job markets for IT professionals and curious as to what types of servers that they have their networking department support, um, if you ask the HR department about that, they're not going to have any trouble saying, well, you know, when we hire people, we're looking for people that support Windows 2000 or Windows 2003 with XP workstations, you know, and from there you're able to glean just a little bit more information, well, you know, what types of service packs, you know, things like that. You're going to get an idea of what types of systems you're going to physically attack. Um, once you're getting to know HR people, you, you can run with this ruse repeatedly as long as you don't give yourself up. Um, Um, a lot of people, when they do this to other companies, you know, they can either make up a company name, try to try to take on a company name that's very reputable in the business. Um, if you don't have any imagination skills, it gets really hard to to start bringing this stuff up. Um, it's like playing a role-playing game, except without the whole game part. You know, you're it, things just don't happen for you. You've got to actually go out and try to try to pull information piece by piece. You're not going to call up someone and they're not going to give you every last bit of information you want in one try. You're going to have to call up three or four times maybe just to get, you know, an address or, you know, a credit report or something like that. You know, you, you've got to have that patience to, to keep working with, with the people. Um, once you enter into their world, their business, you know, the ball is in their court. You have to be able to just bounce around and keep up with them, making them think that you're doing what you what you've told them you're doing. Um, you know, 
for people that, that you know, know everything or just don't have patience or think they know everything and don't have patience, um, you can blow yourself really quick. Um, and something like that, you don't want to knock at the door at 3 in the morning. You know, It's just not a good thing. Well, actually, no, feds don't wake up till like 6. <laughs> Networking your attack. Uh, when I say networking your attack, I mean just that, you know, networking your resources to further em empower your attack. The more people that you have focused on the target, the better. It can help compromise the target faster. Uh, using multiple targets can help gain both acceptance of your main attacker story, i.e., why they're there, what you need to do, and uh, can also be used to monitor suspicion. A caller can say he's from ABC Computing, he's sending a repair technician in to install a firmware update, or he's from XYZ Company saying they're sending a courier over to pick up some packages. When inside the building, the courier can call the base attacker to confirm whatever, as the target can call back to the base attacker to confirm whatever story, helping giving your story authenticity. Uh, physical attendance is not recommended, obviously, but under extreme circumstances, it may not be avoidable. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing excellent. Uh, here's a ex couple examples of various attacks. Okay. Uh, I would be the target and I'm, uh, I'm going to play the, attacker. the uh, attacker. Um, hello. Hi, this is Jack in HR. Who may I speak with? Uh, this is Jane in accounting. Hi, Jane. We have been having some issues in contacting the accounting database to pull a few user files. You have been experience. Have you been experiencing any con uh, connectivity issues over there? No, everything is running smoothly. Okay. Well, we have been fighting this thing tooth and po tooth and nail. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Dude, no, it's fucking dying. There we go. All right. Did you see that? Yeah, my battery's dying. Uh. <laughs> All right, I was wondering if I could have you forward me the files for uh, Joe Pl Public, you know, it could be for whoever, or could I have someone come in and pick it up, whatever works for you guys over there. Uh, sure, I can get that out. You, where do you want me to send it to? Can you e email it to me? Uh, tell me, you know, tell them to email it, whatever your email address is. You might want to use a, uh, a fake email address. Don't use your real email address. That'd just be Take really stupid. <laughs> This attack would be good for, um, like, like Phantasm was saying, like later in the day, people rush trying to get home. That'll further give your story authenticity. You know, I'm trying to get out of here. I can't access this. I got to get it done before the day's out, etc. Example number two. Yo, yeah, I got, I got power now. I'm good to go. <laughs> uh, Human Resources, this is Christy. Hey, hi, Christy. This is Greg in pa the pack uh, parking garage. You know <laughs> the access cards you use to get into the parking garage and the elevators? Well, we've had a problem, and we are reprogramming the cards for all the new hires from the last 15 days. Uh, so what do you need? you need their names or? Um, their phone numbers and their phone numbers. Uh, I can check the new hire list and call you back. What's your number? I'm at 87. Uh, I'm going on a break. How about if I call you back in about an hour? All right, that's fine with me. All right. And uh, uh, after giving like the needed time, obviously, for uh, for your story, and then calling back. Uh, oh yes, well there's just two: Sammy Self in uh, finance, and she's a secretary, and then there's a new VP, Mr. Tanner. And their phone numbers. Uh, right, Mr. Tanner is 3423. Sammy Self is 2432. You have been a big help, thanks. Don't, and uh, after you get off the phone with somebody, just don't blow them off. Like, okay, thanks, you gave me what I wanted. You know, you, you know, just be nice to them. Because if you do something like that, they're all going to be like, okay, that was really, you know, stupid. They might have tape recorded it or something. So you want to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to be nice, Alex. Yeah, nice pays off. <coughs> uh, example number three. Uh, financing, this is Sammy. I'm glad I've found somebody working this late. Listen, this is Robert Walls. I'm publisher of the business division. I don't think we've been introduced. Welcome to the company. 
Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sammy, I'm in Nashville, and I've got a crisis on my hands. This will only take about 10 minutes of your time. Sure, what do you need? Go up to my office. Do you know where that is? Nope. Okay, it's at the corner of the office on the 13th floor, room 1337. I'll call you there in a few minutes. When you get to the office, you'll need to press the forward button on the phone so my call won't go directly through my voicemail. Mm, sure, okay, I'll run up there now. Uh, you know, once she's in the office, the attacker can have, you know, Sammy do whatever, launch all sorts of attacks on the computer there locally, you know, ranging from forwarding emails to installing remote access Trojans. Uh, you know, within 10 minutes of the original call, the attacker can have her in the office looking around. You know, another call back to the office can further instruct her on whatever you want. Um, to further have it, like to help infect the machine. Once she did this, it'll let the you know it'll let the attacker have full access to the system. The back door will be in place, and nobody will have a clue of what's going on. Um, some back doors have problems working on lands, so you need to try something like uh, Assassin from Evil Eye. Uh, I think Sub Seven is working on NT now. Yeah, I think there was a release for it. <laughs> You know, once, once you get her to execute the program, that's pretty much all you need. Tasks like restarting the computer, uh, pillaging through files, moving files, deleting things, that can all be done remotely. So everything, once it's installed, you have it from there. You know, this is how most attacks happen. There's nothing really anybody could do about it. Whenever a backdoor application is released to the computer, the hacker on the other side has pretty much 100% control of whatever that goes in and out, you know, this will let the our attacker do whatever he likes to the computer and land. Most of the attacks will not be reported as you not hear about it due to half of them don't even figure out what's actually going on. This is extremely short. A, a very large part of this presentation was live calls and we have no access. Uh, yeah, Unless so we can figure something out with a phone or something. Yeah, we, uh, we have a special guest with us. He's a uh, writer from uh, 2600, Lucky 225. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, various attack methods and some so a little bit of stuff about social engineering that we haven't touched on. And then we're going to get your guys' questions. All right. Is this mic on? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, social engineering is like basically. <laughs> All right. Testing. All right. Is that good enough? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, but social engineering comes in handy a lot, and like, like uh, they said about if you call the 800 number, they can get your A and I. But I mean, if if you social engineer the phone company, you can spoof your A and I to anything you want. So I mean, you can make it look like it's coming from an inside call from the company, and that gives you even more authenticity. And as far as like personal information goes, like. Uh, a couple months ago, my girlfriend got her uh, car stolen, and our cell phone was in it. And the police basically did not want to do anything else to help us uh, find the car. And so they had they have been using our cell phone. So I just looked at all the phone numbers and did reverse lookups on them. And <laughs> uh, they had also called a couple hotels in my local area. So I went to the hotels and I social engineered them into giving me PBX call logs of the room numbers they were in. And uh, I had found out that uh, they had been calling other numbers that were also on my call detail for the cell phone. So <laughs> I pretty much had all this information to nail them, and I gave the call records to the police and told them they're staying in these hotels, and they've also made calls to f phone numbers that are on my stolen cell phone from the, P from the PBX at the hotel. And the police still didn't do shit. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they basically said I was invading their privacy when they're stealing my car and my cell phone. But, uh, <laughs> well, I figured I'd have uh, some more fun with uh, the people that stole my car. But um, anyways, so it comes in handy for stuff like that. And uh, if you need people's personal info, if you have like one item of information, that's basically all you need. Like if you have an address, you can call a Pizza Hut and say you're uh, or if I mean, if you have a phone number and you need their address, you can call a pizza and say you're making a delivery. They go, sure. What's the phone number? And you give them their phone number, and they go, all right. Uh, and you're still living at one three three seven Crystal Court. Yeah, thanks. You know. And then your next step is to call, uh, you know, the electric company and like, get some more information on them. I mean, like, there's a tax you can do to get like social security numbers. Call up utility companies. If you can verify enough information, tell them like 
you know, I'm trying to log online to do online billing and it keeps saying my social's invalid. But really, the one we have on file is 585. <laughs> you know, is that yours? No, but I'm sure it's his. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do and basically it comes down to people trusting you and you giving off a good front. You know, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Catch Me If You Can, that's a good in-person social engineering movie. Um, you know, and it, even though it's set in the 1960s, a lot of that shit still works today. Um, so basically, you know, it comes down to human trust. You got, you got all sorts of targets, banks, utility companies, anyone who ha has information databases and people who have access to it without verifying information. I mean, you really can't verify over the phone. You, got, you, got to, you have to have people come down in person and show ID. That's really the only way you can do verification. I mean, like, bank, banks let you set up accounts just using a social over the phone and using some mail forwarding. But I mean, you know, and uh, for my bank account, I, I don't even give them my social. And basically, I, it's, it's better because if someone tries to social me, my social's not on file. I don't, my transient credit report doesn't have a social security number on it. Um, <laughs> and basically, I, it's better because you, you have to go to the bank and show them ID. And, you know, that's just more secure. I don't see why everyone trusts information over the phone or online when you're not even showing any authenticity. So, yeah. <laughs> we have a second. All right. Uh, if you guys have any questions about our speech or whatever, you just want to figure out some more stuff about social engineering, you can ask us now. We have some time left. Yeah, we got plenty of time. So, all right. Alright. Well, do you mean in person or over the phone when you go out? Well, I mean, over the phone, getting credibility is uh, really easy. You just uh, find, find a phone number that's listed for them, have the phone company forward it to like a loop number. All the phone freaks will have some loops for you. And then just have them say, you know what, this is our main number, it's listed in the phone book. Give me a call back, give, me, give us a call back and they can verify that I'm out on a call for you. You know? <laughs> You, you, you've got to yell. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in person, basically, it comes down. You got to show some credentials. You know, making it, just make a photo ID in Photoshop that looks legit and laminate it. <laughs> All, right. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm going to the louder mic. All right. What about Go. For uh, that, yeah, that really helps because people don't shred their uh, stuff before they throw it in in the garbage, and that's just more information to deal with, you know. <laughs> Actually, you brought up something really good. You know, if you're out dumpster diving and a cop comes up wondering what in the world you're doing in this company's dumpster, you're going to have to make this cop believe that you're actually down in there picking up boxes for a friend that's moving, or that you lost your cat and it just somehow jumped inside of this locked dumpster. <laughs> um, you know, you. You know, when you're dumpster diving, you always run the risk of having to think on your toes of security or even another employee is walking up. You know, it's... All right, the guy in the back with the black shirt on, the sunglasses on top of his head. Yeah. Yeah, it but it doesn't have a speakerphone. And no one has an FM transmitter. Yeah, nobody <laughs> has an FM transmitter. Unless if you got the stuff in your backpack. I've been asking that to uh, people all day, so... Uh, feedback. It's going to cost too much feedback, and there's RF. Yeah. Mm, plus, yeah. That one. <laughs> you want to try? You want to try? That's it. All right. Uh, we got that phone up here still, or no? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could do that. Does this look new to you? <laughs> what is that, man? It's like, wow, <laughs> that's old. All right, you guys are going to have to be really quiet. I mean, super quiet, no joke.
Okay, let's see. That's like the wrong thing to say in front of this crowd. Welcome to Pacific Gas and Electric Company. We're here to serve you. No, it's a turn up all the way. Press 1 for power outages, gas leaks, or any ha If your presence is required for a service appointment, you may request that One moment while we transfer your call. Please hold on. Oh, I'm going to get through that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah, can I check my account balance, please? You may. Do you have to have the account number or... The I'm sorry, hold on one second. Can you speak up a little louder? Okay, do you have to have the account number or the address? Uh, let me give you my service address. It's... It's 4541 Foster Way, Carmichael, California. Is there an apartment number? I'm sorry, what? Is there an apartment number? No. And who am I speaking with? I'm sorry, what? Who am I speaking with? My name is Adam Watts. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There's a horrible echo on the phone. My name is Mr. Watts. Account balance is one dollar fifty nine bank credit. Um, let me try my other house. It's 4809 Foster Way. 4809? Uh-huh. I'm sorry, 4809? Yeah, 4809. Okay. And you're Mr. Watts? Yeah. Okay. Um, then I'm not sure that I have the right account up because I don't have Watts there. Okay. Well, <laughs> see, I didn't verify with PG&E. I did this uh, on PETA because I only had 15 minutes to look up some info. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah. Hello, I'd like to make a delivery. Yeah, my phone number is Your nine. Phone number. I'm sorry, what? Your home phone number? Yeah, four eight nine three okay. seven two five. Three seven two five? Yeah. Okay. Four eight nine three seven two five. Forty eight zero nine Foster Way. Yeah, that's where I live and it's under Watts, right? I'm sorry. And it's under the name Watts? I'm sorry, who? Amy. Annie? Amy, Amy. A M Y. A N Y? A M Y. And what's the last name? I don't have a last name here, I just got it. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so it must be under Amy Watts. If any girl wants to come up here and try and social PG and E. Uh, <laughs> 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 But basically, uh, you'd call up, P if we didn't have the phone number, we'd call up PG&E like I did before and give them that address and say we want to check our balance to make it sound legit. And then you just tell them, uh, yeah, I tried entering my phone number on the automated system and it didn't bring up the account and it transferred me to you. Uh, could you just verify what phone number I have on there? And they'll be like, oh, I have 916-489-3725. All right, thanks very much. And, you know, even if it's an unlisted number, there you go. Any more questions? Yeah, um, 
That, that, that's why you should have someone call ahead of time and tell them that someone else is coming. That way they can expect it. And, you know, talk to the person up front because the, the, the people at the front desk are usually a little bit dumber <laughs> and they'll let you do it. And if they don't, just uh, have them contact the person that you called before and be like, you know, my boss said uh, he's going to send me down here. This is a quick 30-minute job and I got another, I got another call, so I really got to get out of here. You know, and then they'll, they'll probably let you in if they already if spoke to that person. I think uh, phys like actual appearance does have a very big play. Like, say if if it was me and versus Alex, if Alex critical mass was to go in, or if I was going, you know, with my mohawk up, they'd probably believe his story and give him a little bit credi more credibility than they would me. Yeah, He's exactly. You know, that more the nice, clean-cut looking young man, whereas. I'm not so. <laughs> but we always rip on him. And obviously, though, when you go in person, it's a little more hard because you've got to show credentials. And that's why you shouldn't give information out over the phone. If, if something sounds sketchy, you should have the person come down in person and show ID. I mean, if they went through that, that much trouble, they're probably going to get it anyways from somewhere else. <laughs> Um, I don't want to interrupt, but uh, I just got noticed we have a very special guest here, and it's even more special, especially since like a bunch of people have left, so they're really going to miss this. Um, I want to thank the man that's coming up to save our asses right now, Mr. <laughs> Kevin Mitnick. Hi everyone. I'm not prepared with anything because this is just like right off the cuff. But social engineering sometimes is really about doing things right off the cuff. Extra, extra <coughs> God, I can't even, t uh, do you have any water? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what I'm going to do, since I'm not even prepared, is I thought to give you some good examples from my, uh, my history. Since I'm not profiting from this particular talk, I can talk about anything. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> when I... <coughs> When I do my normal public speaking, <clears throat> I can't talk about my personal exploits uh, because I'm not allowed to make money for a period of seven years uh, from the time I was sentenced on anything to do with my uh, personal exploits. But if I'm not profiting, like today, to make it clear, because I'm sure there's some federal agents in the uh, audience here, <laughs> right? Anyway, tell you tell you a little story. Several years ago, past the statute of limitations. I found a vulnerability in NEC's, um, they had a firewall um, system that was running a, uh, under Unix, and I found a vulnerability in their SMTP. And I was able to exploit that vulnerability and gain access to their internal network. But there was a particular system that I wanted to get access to because that's where the source code to the NEC phones were, and I wanted to get access to the source code to see basically how these phones worked. So remember Finger D, when everybody used to run Finger D and you can do a finger on a host and you can see the people that were logged in? So I did Finger D, I, I ran Finger on this particular host and it lists, of course it listed the people that were logged in. And uh, there was this guy logged in, had his name, his telephone extension, uh, what department he was in. It was real simple, right? All the information was there. So I call this guy up on the phone. I say, hey, this is Bob over in IT. I'm calling about that problem that was reported. He goes, I didn't report a problem. I go, well, do you work with uh, Langford? Because I did a little bit of research and I found out the names of other people in that department, which all good social engineering attacks do, is they actually do have a research phase, which I'll talk about in a minute. So he goes, well, he's not here right now. I said, well, great. Um, uh, have you created any files that begin with a dot? Because that was the problem. People were complaining that they create a file beginning with a period and it wouldn't show up. And the guy goes, <laughs> Why would I create a file with a period? I always, I always use file names. I go, well, do you have a .r host file? And the guy, the guy goes, what's that? <laughs> and I go, well, I'm going to show you. <laughs> so I had the guy fire up, uh, I think it was Ed, under Unix Ed. And I said, well, let's test this out and see if this, uh, this is failing, if we can't create uh, files with a period, because this is a serious problem that we have to look into. So I said, well, let's make it easy. I'll just have you put in two plus signs separated by space. So I do plus plus. I had him save the file. 
of course. And I said, well, listen, this is, this is the test. Do you know how to do a directory command in Unix? He goes, yeah, ls. I go, that's exactly right, do an ls. He did, he did an ls. And of course, uh, I go, did the file, the file show up? He goes, no. I go, oh, so we're still having the problem. Well, I'm going to have to work on this for a while. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, I'm already logged into the host, right? And, I, and I'm going to have to work on this a while, and then uh, I'll give you a call back, right? So you, everyone here you know, gets that kind of attack, right? This is where people don't understand the consequences of what they do. So because this guy wasn't that computer literate with the Unix operating system, he didn't realize if he creates a .r host file with two plus signs, he's basically allowing the world into his box. And that was because he didn't understand. So what are the, does, does anyone out, out, out here in the audience know the three primary reasons why social engineering, social engineering attacks work so well? No? Well, it's true there's no patch for stupidity. You can't go to Windows Update and download it. No, three things. No, people, people aren't aware of the threat of social engineering, right? They don't know there's people out there that are going to try to manipulate and deceive them, right? Two is people don't understand the value of information. This is uh, how, how clever attacks are actually created is where the attacker calls different business units and different departments within the organization or the enterprise and obtains bits and pieces of information, right, that are innocuous an employee number, a telephone extension, an email address, um, the uh, name of the guy in the mailroom, the, the, guy, the woman in the county. Gets all, this, all these little bits and pieces of information that are innocuous. When you take this information and you can combine it together, well, now you got kind of an inside look into that enterprise, right? You know, you know a little bit about it, so you're, you have more credibility when you're speaking with somebody on the inside. And that's what really social engineering is about. It's really the art of manipulation and deception of getting people to comply with a request. Whether that request is to reveal proprietary information or to do some sort of action. And when they do that action, it lets the, the attacker in, like for example, creating the, the .r host file. Um, I remember when I was a fugitive, I lived in Denver, Colorado. And I, and I, worked, and I worked for a law firm uh, for about a year. Of course, the name I wasn't using Kevin Mitnick at the time because it would have probably been easy to find me, so I, I chose uh, the name Eric Weiss. Does anybody know who Eric Weiss is? Harry Houdini, right? So I worked in this law firm, and one of my coworkers handed me the new brochure that Motorola had out for the Microtech Ultralight phone. And I thought that was a cool damn phone, and at the time I was into cellular technology. I wanted to, I wanted to know how these phones worked. I was very interested in the protocols. I was interested in, in getting access to the firmware. Of course, we know there's two ways of doing that, looking at the source code or reverse, or reverse engineering. Well, I figured getting access to the source code would be faster. So I was around 3 o'clock on this one afternoon, and it was snowing in Denver. And on the way out of the office, I powered on my Novotel PTR825 cell phone, which had some special firmware in there and uh, called 800 information. And I asked for the telephone number to Motorola. And the nice information operator gave me the phone number, so I called up, 800 in, I called up the 800 number and I said, hey, this is uh, Richard uh, Salisbury. I'm with the um, Arlington Heights, uh, I'm on the Arlington Heights campus of Motorola. Can you please uh, tell me who is the project manager for the cellular subscriber group? So I got transferred around to a couple of people, and I ended up at somebody at the executive level that deals with that with a with a, what they call the Pacific. Uh, it's been a long time. Pan American Cellular Subscriber Group. And I talked to this executive. He says, "Yes, um, I'm I'm actually in charge of the whole cellular subscriber division." And I said, "Well, listen, I'm over in the uh, Arlington Heights um, Engineering Group, and I need to talk to one of the engineers. Who's who's the project manager?" So. He didn't feel there was any harm in giving me the information, so he told me it was this lady named Pam Dillard. I go, great, thank you very much. So I call Pam, and the phone rings once, and I hear this voicemail message. And Pam says, on her out, outgoing greeting, that uh, she is on vacation, and she'll be back in a date uh, two weeks into the future. And if you have any problems or you need any help to call Alicia on extension, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a great foot in the door. <laughs> so I call Alicia, 
And I go, hi, did Pam leave? I, I go, hi, this is so-and-so. Uh, I forgot what name I used at the time. Arlington Heights Engineering. Did Pam leave yet? Because she was supposed to send me something. She goes, oh, yeah, she just left uh, a couple days ago. I go, you've got to be kidding. Do you have her cell phone number? And she goes, yeah, but she's out of the country. I go, my God, did she tell you, did she tell you uh, about the project we're working on? She goes, no. I go, oh, because well, she was supposed to send me the latest rev of, for the uh, Microtech Ultralight release, the latest source code rev. She goes, oh, I can help you. I go, okay, great. Uh, but she, she knew what server the source code was on, and, but she didn't know it specifically how this was, or she didn't know the, the, how to get to the newest release. So I was on the phone with this woman for a good hour trying to help her because I found out it was an HP UX Apollo system, trying to help her find the code. And I didn't know anything about their structure, right? Eventually, in Pam's account, there was a little script that allowed you to extract the latest version of the source code. So then the next problem was, well, it's, she has access to it, but how do I get it, right? So I had to talk her through of using how to use tar and compress so we can make it into one little file. Then I said, well, listen, why don't you send it over to me at the Arlington Heights? So let's do FTP. So I had her fire up FTP. And, and in the process of doing this, I'm, I'm going, wow, i got to think of an account I have somewhere. So I actually had several accounts at Colorado Supernet, which was an ISP. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be a problem because I'm not on campus there, and I don't have access to a system there. So I said, well, listen, we're having problems with our DNS server. So what I'm going to need you to do is to open, and I gave her the IP address rather than the host name, right? Because if she didn't realize that that IP address wasn't mapped to a system on campus, she wouldn't have been the wiser. Well, she didn't check, and she opened a connection, and it went open. Could open an FTP connection outside Motorola, right? So I go, wow, something must be wrong. She goes, well, hold on. I'll find out what's wrong. And she puts me on hold. And I'm, I'm going, shit, uh-oh, because now she's going to check with somebody else. And that's exactly what you don't want to happen. So about five minutes later, she comes, she comes uh, back to the phone. She goes, oh, listen, I just talked to our system manager, and this is a big security issue, and we can't connect to systems outside the campus or something like that. But he showed me a way that I could do it through one of our proxy servers. <laughs> I, uh, right? I go, well, I go, well he, he's a great guy. Great. So she fired up, she fired up the proxy server, right? And I uh, had to connect to the IP address. I recalled the name and password. And within, and, and, and mind you, I, leave my, I left my office around 3 o'clock. By the time I got to my front door in around 3.17, 3.18, walking home from the office, um, by the time I put the key in the front door, she had already transferred the tar, the tar ball, the compressed tar ball of the Motorola source code. And why did that work, right? You have to ask yourself, are people really that stupid? And I don't think people are stupid. There's, uh, there's two types of thinking that uh, clever social engineers could use. People either think systematically or heuristically, right? Systematically is where you think logically about what somebody is asking you to do or asking you for. You think about the logical argument. Does this really make sense? And then there's heuristic mode of thinking. This is where people are kind of what we call lazy thinkers. And we could use things called mental cues to trigger them, like psychological triggers to, to trigger them to comply with a request. And for those that have uh, looked at my book, The Art of Deception, I discuss those cues. Really, they're, they're authority, they're reciprocity, liking, scarcity, uh, social validation, and consistency. So I'll give you an, an example. Um, Ten minutes? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll wrap this up. Um, reciprocity attack, all right? Uh, how many of you have heard of what we call the door in the face technique? It's a psychological te technique you, you hear in sci Psychology 101. This is where you ask for something out of the ordinary that's a huge request, right? Um, for something that somebody is not going to do. Hey, I need you to send me a copy of your whole hard drive. Or something just ridiculous that's not going to happen. Well, of course, um, the person's not comply. They're going to basically say no. You know, uh, they're going to find an excuse not to not to agree with your request. So then, when you ask for something smaller than the original big request, you're what it's called. You're compromising. You ask for something big, and they decline. So you say, okay, since you can't do this, can you do this real small thing? Can you um, download this piece of software and test it for me, and just see if it runs for you, or something something very simple, right? 
and people will reciprocate with your compromise and compromise themselves and agree to the smaller request. That's called the door in the face technique. So how does an attacker use reciprocity? Is the attacker might call different departments within the enterprise, right? And say they're with the help desk or with IT and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, calling to, uh, I'm calling back on a, on a case of trouble that was reported. And 50% of the time, you're going to get somebody that has, has a problem with their computer, right? An Outlook or something to do with their system. Let's say you don't. So you're with the IT department. You're calling from network operations. There's a problem. And you walk through, through, through the user through their normal uh, steps of signing on the system or whatever they normally do during the day to verify that their system is OK. OK? So now you did that person a favor. And when you do somebody a favor, they usually like to reciprocate in like kind, right? So they'll do you a favor. You say, OK, well, great. I'm glad we got your system up and running. You're not going to have any problems today. And by, by the way, before we go, I need you to do this. Small request. But that small request is something that lets the bad guy into the system and stuff like that. So um, since I don't have that much time, um, I just wanted to go over a little bit about uh, a couple of my own stories and a couple of the psychological triggers that people use. Um, the other, the biggest one, by the way, before I go, is liking. This is developing rapport and trust with the target, is if the target likes the person that is speaking with them over the phone, for example, the more likely they are to, uh, they are to comply with the request. What is liking involved? That's where you flatter somebody over the telephone. Or if it's a female, if the person perceives that they're attractive, they'll comply with the request. Or if the attacker is able through their research to determine what that person's hobbies and interests and where they grew up, because now the attacker, through first doing the research, could be from the same area, went to the same school, has the same hobbies and interests. When people have similar interests, you like other people that have this, you know, like we're kind of like all hackers, right? So other people that are computer enthusiasts or hackers, you like automatically like them in a way. And you're more likely to comply with what they want you to do. Um, so I don't know what else, uh, since this is not a prepa uh, prepared talk to talk over, but uh, if you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer it. Again, I'm just coming up here on the fly, so I'm not prepared. I didn't expect to do this. Uh, there's a lot to talk about this topic. It's uh, Social engineering is not just talking somebody out of their password. That's the media definition of uh, social engineering. The clever social engineers, the last resort is asking for somebody's password. There's what we call like man in the middle of attacks for social engineering. One quick example I'll give back to you. Uh, a fax exploit. Let's say that the, the attacker wants to get particular information from an enterprise, and the best way to do that is to deceive somebody into faxing that, right? So the attacker calls up the telephone receptionist of that enterprise, maybe even another office location, and, and says, some, makes up some sort of pretext, hey, I'm, I'm outside the office. I have an important fax coming in. I can't get back into the office until this time. And this is critical. Do you, do you have a fax, that, uh, a fax machine near you or in, in the reception area? Well, receptionists are there to help, right? That's their job. They're, they're there to help the, the company get along with uh, communications and such. In most cases, receptionists have access to fax machines. And they'll agree. They'll say, OK, you know, no problems. I have a fax sent. I'll hold it for you. Great. So now the attacker calls the real target within the company and uses a pretext that they need a particular piece of information or some documents fax, and, they'll, and the attacker will now use, and now they have an internal fax number at the company, right? And they'll use another pretext to get the target to fax that information to the internal fax machine, right? So now it's on the fax there at the reception area. So then after that transaction is complete, the attacker calls back to the receptionist and then tells the receptionist, hey, listen, I ran late in the sales meeting. I have to run to uh, another meeting or what, whatever. And now has the receptionist fax that fax over to something like eFax or, or Kinko's or whatnot. <laughs> so that's where, that's where the attackers could set up a sense of trust that the information is just going internally and not outside the company. And that could work with, uh, with uh, source code or with uh, proprietary information that's FTP'd internally and then moved out by somebody that doesn't realize the value of that information. So um, thanks. I hope Thank that you. was a little bit informative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
All right, um, well, we have to go now because we ran over our time. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, we'll, we'll be walking around for a while. Or we're going to go step out right over there. So if you guys have any questions, just go through double. They can go through the double doors over there, right? Go through the, the double doors over there, and uh, we'll be standing out there. We can answer whatever questions you have. I think the other speaker wants to come up here, but I don't, I don't know. I think we should continue thanks with for, our speech. Thanks for sticking it out, everyone. Thank you.